All right. Um, seems that everyone is starting sharply on time, so I'm not going to deviate. Uh, so my name is Daniel Huoso. I've been at <laughs> Bloomberg. <laughs> Been at Bloomberg for eight years. Uh, this, uh, however, is an interesting thing where, like, a fun project that you worked like 15 years ago, uh, kind of like plays into like your future. So, 15 years ago, I was uh, helping the Pro6 community like on the design of the language, and at that time, I got like a super like deep appreciation to like just how easy it is to underestimate how complex this problem is. Uh, and my hope in this talk is that by the end of it, you're going to be convinced that all that complexity has been encapsulated enough that you don't have to be like a programming languages expert in order to build tools. You don't necessarily need to have like a large team uh, of people uh, developing these like frameworks and tools in order to be able to apply that in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, code. So on, on this talk, I'm going to try very briefly to like just make a bit of history of like how the language tools development has gone over the past years. Talk a little bit about our experience at Bloomberg. And then finally, uh, I'm going to go through essentially a tutorial session on how you write a, a tool using the facilities that, that we've released. Um, so, some 10 years ago, if, if you wanted to write any like C or C++ static analysis, either you would have to invest a ridiculous amount of time re-implementing all the semantics that the compilers did, or you would have to cope with the problems of GCC. I'm not going to add too much on the Sure, uh, but uh, GCC, I, I, I don't want to get like, too judgmental about the, the problems of GCC. There is like, a very important political aspect of like, how GCC is designed that actually paid off. Uh, like G++ only exists because of the aggressive like, GPL format of GCC. Uh, so I, I'm not going to be judgmental about that. But the fact is, if you wanted to write a GCC plugin, it would be hard. It would not be something that you would do with any like smile in your face. It would be a very depressing process. Around the time of LVM 3.8, this picture changed like rather drastically, because suddenly people realized that like oh we have this new compiler that has a reasonable API, and it's very easy to write tools based on that on, on that compiler. And there was like this huge boom of tools around the time of LVM 3.8, which ended up kind of being a problem as well, because LVM was still like very much in flux. And, and so for that reason, there is a number of tools that are still stuck in LVM 3.8 because they, they didn't manage to go uh, through the process of like redoing their code against the, the newer APIs. Uh, around the time of Clang 4, Clang tooling came about, and Clang tooling like really changed everything. And I know that like a lot of people think that just, why don't you just build Clang yourself? Why don't you just write your code inside of the Clang code base? But there is like a high barrier to entry if the first step is you need to build your tool chain from scratch. So what Clang tooling provided was a way to like kind of isolate yourself in terms of the development workflow. And now you were able to start building a tool that was not inside of the Clang uh, source tree. And that, that has really like, enabled a, a, a new explosion of tools. And hopefully more and more people are like, keeping up to date. It's also true that the LVM APIs and Clang APIs have become more mature. And in our experience from Clang 4 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 7, we had like one or two small changes that we had to do. So that comes to the experience at Bloomberg. So Bloomberg is a 30 plus years old IT company uh, with 30 plus years old code still in production. Um, this is not necessarily bad. Like, this is what the company makes money with. 
40? OK, uh, I'm losing track of time. Um, uh, but one other aspect, which is everyone that I talked with that, that is in an environment of like an old IT company has the same experience, which is that there is a very wide amount of code reuse across different areas of the organization. Uh, and by that I mean you essentially have like a single development environment. Sometimes you end up in a single address space. So you need to like be able to maintain all this code. You can't really break a lot of, uh, it's really hard to, to make uh, slicing changes where you say like, no, like this part of the world can, can just move on and this other part stays behind. We do have one advantage, which is the, the really old code is all continuously built and continuously deployed. Uh, it doesn't have tests, but we do build them uh, and we do deploy them on a weekly basis. And I, I asked around and the evidence is that we have been doing that since the early 90s, which is kind of cool. So in that context, uh, uh, a new team was formed around a year and a half ago. It's a team that I'm leading, which is the Static Analysis and Automated Refactoring team. And the goal of this team, uh, in no small part, was to help us push like the last miles of the, the Linux migration. We still have a number of systems running Solaris and AIX. Most of our new code should be running on Linux, but we have to make like this last mile push. Uh, so the goal of this team was to create frameworks and methods uh, for us to make these code-wide changes. And, and we had um, a specific goal as like a proof of concept, um, which was to refactor a specific uh, legacy configuration system, I should say, a revenue generating configuration system. Uh, I'm going to use Senkel's words. Uh, and this configuration system was essentially like a feature toggle, like runtime feature toggle that you control like when a feature is enabled or disabled. Uh, and so there is a point, and again, this is an int unintentional echo of uh, Senkel's talk from yesterday. It's hard to justify going back to remove an old subsystem when that subsystem is essentially frozen. It does not change, it does not break, it's there. So the cost of removing it needs to be sufficiently low for it to make sense to spend the effort on doing it. So when we started this, uh, and I should make a parenthesis that we are doing that both in C, C++ code uh, using Clang and on old Fortran code using a Haskell library called Fortran source, but I'm not going to talk about Haskell today. Um, and so Clang Meta Tool was part of this learning experience and, and the, ability, the, the idea that, that we should be able to produce these tools fast enough such that we can address a wide range of issues and just push, push the changes through in, in kind of like a pipeline way. We also had to map out the details of how the revenue generating system worked. Uh, this was surprisingly hard because this was like a 25 year old system with obviously no documentation. Uh, so I essentially had to like reverse engineer the entire system to know that like I can actually understand how the system works such that I can build and run a tool that removes that subsystem from, from the code base. So what does that mean for everyone else? Uh, and I think if, if I'm successful, I'm going to have proved this point by the end. All the really hard problems are solved with reusable code at this point. The AST Matcher API in Clang is an incredible game changer, like being able, like having to match a tree with a visitor pattern is incredibly terrible. Uh, so the AST Matcher API provides like a really concise and clear way of just matching like a, a complex data structure within the AST and it really changed how quickly we can come up with new, new tools. At this point, I, I, I honestly think cost, the cost benefit of automation is favorable for many more people than it was five years ago. So now I'm going to kind of start into our tutorial section. Um, 
And I, I thread a very fine line here between trying to give enough information about what we're doing and not being super boring. And I definitely don't have Hannah's like awesome slide skills from, uh, from uh, the CTRE uh, talk. So bear with me. So we're going to go through a problem statement. And this is all fictitious code. Uh, fiction code? Uh, uh, this is not real code. Uh, it's just like an example that I made up uh, that allowed me to exercise different things that will show how you can use Clang Meta tool. Uh, then we're going to go through how to actually do that. And finally, uh, go through some workflow consideration on what does it mean to make this kind of code change across the code base over and over again. So let's go to our problem statement. So we want to rework a revenue generating feature to uh, toggle infrastructure. Um, we have a newer API that is better, but it's incompatible. You can justify the effort of removing that subsystem if it's automated. You can't justify having people going there and changing the code, but you can justify having a tool doing it uh, and the cost for it, uh, related to that. So here's our uh, fictional uh, feature toggle uh, library. It's the EOLD feature toggle uh, that takes a feature uh, ID as an integer and returns an integer. Uh, pretty straightforward. So some code written 20 years ago would have something like, if the old feature toggle is enabled, three, four, five, six, seven, then euro is in fact, then calculate ra rates in eurozone, else calculate rates uh, in the old way for France. Uh, again, fictional example, but this is not real code. Um, although I, I would not suspect, I, I would not doubt that a very similar code would be in our code base. Uh, again, an intentional echo from uh, yesterday's Sankles talk. This code works. It's not like people are stuck maintaining this like every day. This is code that was written 20 years ago and has been generating revenue ever since. So the justification to go and change it has to be pretty good. And the cost has to be pretty low. Uh, I have an, a, a couple other examples of how this could be used. It could be in a macro. Uh, so the macro kind of like hints that like, oh, I, I can't just use grep uh, and sad. Uh, and it may get even more complicated because people really like to reuse variables. Uh, and so you have like a variable setting the feature ID and then you use the feature ID in the function call and then you set the feature ID to a different value and then you use it in, the, in a different function call. Again. If you think back into like this, the programming style from like 20 years ago, the idea of reusing a variable to reduce stack was, was kind of like a heroic thing to do. Uh, so, and again, this took a lot more time for us. And again, it's a parallel system, but there's a lot of similarities from this example. Understanding uh, the old system, you need to do the archeology span work. And there's a lot of archaeology work to be done. Like you need to truly understand, you need to be confident enough that you will remove that subsystem without changing behavior. You also have to freeze the old system, uh, which was mostly frozen already because no one is touching it. But we just needed to make sure that like no one could toggle any runtime bits anywhere anymore. So anyone using this old system that needed to be able to do runtime switching, like had a mandate to say, if you think you may have to change this, go and rewrite to the new API now. Otherwise, it's going to be automatically removed and replaced by a constant value. Which means that you have to be able to evaluate that function. And that function has to have a constant deterministic value uh, for, for the code base. Again, I'm using this as an example, but hopefully it will go through a bunch of different things that will hopefully be more relatable to more people. So this is our fictional feature toggle implementation uh, since FizzBuzz is all the rage in interviews now. Uh, so the thing to note here is, one, sometimes the value may not be deterministic. 
Uh, sometimes, like you may have a feature toggle that that is not consistently set everywhere, because someone like abandoned the feature like midway through release, and that's a thing. Uh, so you need to be uh, capable of dealing with that, and you also need to be able to deal with like some quirks, which is if you notice like the the else statement, while this looked like a boolean function, it sometimes returns a real value and. Uh, Hiram Law says uh, anything that is there will be used. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but the idea that someone would suddenly use that as like an actual configuration integer instead of a feature toggle is absolutely realistic. So the other thing that, and, and this has been a, a basic principle that we've set from the beginning, we're always going to make the smallest change possible. Because we will review the code manually, because although we trust the tools, the fact that we don't have tests, we have to end up relying on code review asserting that the code change is actually semantically identical, uh, which is hard. Like I had to review like a few like seven lines, seven thousand lines uh, code reviews in the past like months, uh, but you just have to push through it and like double check everything. We did catch one or two tool bugs in the process. So I, I don't think not reviewing is an option at this point. All right. So now we're going to go to like the process of uh, writing a tool. So the first step is going to be to build an install claim at the tool. Then we're going to create a project from a skeleton. And then finally, we're going to create a failing test. So Docker makes lots of workflows super easy. So the claim method tool repository has uh, uh, uses Travis for its CI. So you can just use the Travis uh, Docker file from the project to create a local container and start it. So now you have a like, development environment for claim method tool. Uh, the, the bind mounts are he uh, helpful. So now we're going to just create the new project, uh, copy the skeleton, just rename the, the instances uh, to the name of the tool that we want. And essentially, see make, make, make test. Uh, which ends up ki kind of sad because we don't, we don't have any tests yet. So let's start adding a test. Uh, there's the C standard see make boilerplate. Uh, but this is uh, an interesting lesson learned that we had, which was when we're dealing with code refactoring, the easiest way for us to iterate in the development was to just have a origin file, an expected file, and just have the test run the tool against the file and diff with the expected file. So I'm essentially adding a, a ad hoc CMake test that run our like test build, uh, runner, which essentially Calls the copies the, the, the file, runs the tool in the file, and diffs against the expected file. So for, for example, um, we have a test that is like a simple direct usage. So you have like a function call that has like the literal integer, uh, and the end result that we want is to have that removed. So I'm going to flip back and forth a, a few times. So the first one that we see is that the function call is gone, and it's removed by the literal value that we know the system will return. Uh, we also leave like a breadcrumb for anyone looking at the code later to like, ask your, like be able to ask like, why is there if one here? Uh, the other thing is, since this was the only usage of that header, we also removed the include statement. All right, so now we run ctest, and ctest helpfully tells me, oh, your output file has an extra include statement, and it has that different line that is not what we want. So, so that particular workflow has, has been like incredibly helpful for us to just iterate quickly over the development of tools. Uh, whenever we find a case that the tool didn't handle properly, we can just like add like a .c, .c .expected, uh, or .cpp, .cpp .expected, and we can just iterate like fixing the tool to cover that particular test case and just keep going. Um, 
the, the idea of like full correctness is absolutely not a goal. So we will, the workflow that we follow is, we'll look in the code search, we'll find a representative sample of how this code is used. We'll create test cases for those uh, uh, use cases we saw, and we iterate over that. And then we start running the tool on the entire code that we can run. And we review the changes and we go and see like, oh, this change is not correct. Let me add a test case that uh, exercises this particular pattern uh, and then keep going. So the question is, was this actually what I wanted to write? Uh, so this output is the output of the diff between the, between the output of my tool and the expected file, which means that my tool didn't produce a file that matched what I expected. And this is telling me how it is different. So essentially it's saying like you have an extra include statement because you didn't remove it, and you have that function call because you didn't replace by that, by, by that one. Uh, so yeah, so that that's like a, a it was like a really valuable like just development process uh, learning that we had. Right. The the question was so I just look at sample and produce tests that that are representative of that sample. Yes, uh, the process is just iteratively look at the the, the usages of the code. Identify what is the syntactic pattern that is in that code, create a test case for that syntactic pattern, and iterate over the tool until we can get the expected result. Okay, how does this work? Just talk to you. Okay, so uh, seeing that multi line comment that you put in there, it just reminded me that in old code bases, there are like hundreds of lines of code that somebody commented out temporarily and is meant to put back. Did you try to deal with that, that you have code that is actually comment and contains these kind of patterns? Mm, so the qu uh, I guess I don't need to repeat the question. Uh, so I, we, because we are using Clang, we see what the compiler sees. So we could go around and see like, oh, this comment is really large inside a body of a function and the contents of it look like code, but that's not what we're doing. So the tool that we're building is uh, on what the compiler sees, and it's on, based on the abstract syntax tree. There are a few things that we do based on like the preprocessor directives, but most of the time we're working with the AST. All right, so first step is we need to detect where a function is used. We need to find, uh, and I'm gonna have to throw like some Clang AST node names uh, I hope that the names are like intuitive enough. I think in this case it is. Uh, so we need to find the call expression, uh, call EXPR, for that function call. So in, in this particular code, like we want the node that is the function call itself. So we can use, we can reuse a collector to find the calls to that function. And we can also use a collector for grabbing header data. So anyone that is familiar with Clang tools is probably asking, what are collectors? So you have a question? So does this happen after pre-processing? Because I can envision the collector being built by token pasting or something like that. So it, the, there are two different phases in how a Clang tool works. So you have like a first phase where you can look at like preprocessor callbacks and you can see what the preprocessor is seeing, but it will not go into like the, the uh, else branches uh, on the preprocessor. So you won't see any code that was not actually gonna be parsed. Uh, but after that, you can still see what is, uh, Clang calls it the spelling location. So you can see like where that thing was in the original source code, whether it is inside of the macro expansion, uh, that kind of thing. But that's that's pretty much it. Uh, like you can look at the preprocessor uh, directives that were uh, executed, and then you can look at the AST, and you can know whether like an AST is inside a macro expansion or not. Okay, I guess my question is, imagine you have 
two macros, define A and define B. And A is like the first half of the function name, B is the second half. You paste them together and then you invoke it with a feature ID. Would the tool be able to find this? Because the, the tool is based on the AST, uh, the AST will have the correct name. So it, so it would work. Is after preprocessing, so you're kind of compiling everything, then you get an AST. Not compiling. You do the parsing and the semantic analysis, but you don't do any of the optimization passes. You don't do any of the okay. uh, emission passes. But you do uh, all preprocessing and then... Right, as I said, there are two phases. There's like the preprocessor phase where you don't see any AST, and then there's the ST phase where you don't see the preprocessor anymore, except that you can ask if it was or not. Okay, makes sense. Cool, thanks. So what if the function is called from a pointer? Yeah. So it would be harder. Uh, however, one of the things that we have implemented and I'm going to go through later is the idea of uh, following the control flow graph in Clang. Uh, and Clang has like the CFG API is available to tools. So you can actually traverse the function, uh, the, the control flow graph and see like what is the, the the pointer that was set to this function. Of course, if this is cross-translation unit, then you're kind of out of luck. You would need something like whole program analysis to be able to say like, no, no, no this function pointer that, that uh, we're calling was actually that function right there. Uh, so that is a very important distinction. Like all that I'm talking about here are within a single translation unit. Uh, nothing that we're talking here uh, crosses the translation unit boundary. As you know, in older code bases, we have a tendency to use global variables, and they happen to pervade everything. And in the case of Bloomberg, it's no exception. So how do we deal with global variables that are clearly crossing translation units? The answer is mostly we don't for this particular purpose. Uh, so if a variable is global but with local linkage, we can use some heuristics to tell like this variable is only ever used in an L value context in the initialization. So we know that the value will have, a the variable will have a deterministic value. And we, I'm not gonna go through like the implementation of that heuristics here, but we definitely had to implement that there. All right, so collectors. So callback development is awkward. Like I know that a lot of JavaScript folks say eh, but and, and now with lambdas, I guess C++ folks say too. Uh, but it's awkward. Uh, if, you, if you need to like, build any higher, like, higher level like semantic analysis on callbacks, it will be painful. Uh, it's hard, and, and then it's hard to analyze if you don't have all the data yet. So the, the callback thing, uh, basically means that you're iteratively building data and if you're trying to analyze the data as you're building it, your logic will end up being like very spaghetti-like and it's gonna be very hard to reuse the code that you built for that tool. And then it's hard to refactor if you haven't analyzed yet. So if you're doing the refactorings as you traverse the AST, you have the challenge that you need to be able to build the entire semantic model and figure out like where it makes sense to make a refactoring or not as you're like iterative, iteratively going through the, the, the callbacks from the AST visitor. It's hard. Uh, that, that was actually like, first thing I did was like, I implemented a clone of include what you use just, just to exercise like uh, how clean tooling works. And I did that and, and it was awful. Like I couldn't reuse a single line of code of my experiment because it was all like mishmashed between like the callbacks. So, so that's why we came up with Clang Meta Tool, essentially. Um, the idea is that you have collectors, and collectors are a design pattern uh, that essentially is the only thing that runs from the callbacks. And the only purpose of the collectors is to assemble a bunch of data. Then you run the analysis on a single entry point in straightforward imperative code. You just have all the data available. You can analyze the data, mishmash it, and and decide what you want to do. And then the refactoring, you, you just append to the set of refactoring that Clang tooling is going to make. So you don't have to worry about 
like sequence of changes and like which change has to become has to come first. If there are overlapping changes, like Clang will check if you have overlapping changes and it will uh, abort your changes if you do something uh, wrong. So that has saved us like a lot of cases where we were doing something wrong and Clang just said like, nope, you can't you can't replace like half of a macro and and half of the, the code in, in this, the expansion uh, place. All right, so I'm gonna talk about a couple collectors that, that we're gonna use. So the first one is define calls. So it, it's a collector that you give it a name of a function and it will collect the data about the, specific, the uses of that function. Uh, it maps from the name to the function decal uh, which is the node that represents the actual function declaration. Uh, and it maps from the function declaration to the uh, call expressions uh, where they are used. Uh, and the fact that this mapping happens will come up super handy later. So the other one that we're going to use is the include graph collector. Uh, essentially creates a graph of all the files included in the translation unit. Uh, gathers the uses of like declarations and macros introduced by header. So you essentially end up with like a full graph of like all the declarations, all the uses from all the files. Uh, and yes, this is essentially most of include what you use, but like in a reusable fashion, except for the actually refactoring part. So this is like differing from the skeleton code. So Clang Meta Tool introduces this, I guess, with C17, we can say concept, uh, but it's not a concept yet. Uh, it's just a weak, a weak concept, I guess. Uh, that essentially re redefines the life cycle of the tool in terms of the constructor that registers all callbacks and, and a single entry point at the end of the process that has access to all the data that you uh, uh, gather during the callback phase. And the only thing you need to do is essentially like add that as a member of your tool, initialize it with the, the compiler instance and the match finder. Uh, I really recommend taking a look at the match finder, uh, uh, the Kling AST matchers API, it's, it's amazing. And the same thing for the include graph collector. And essentially after this, uh, when you get to the post-processing phase, you have all the data about the include graph, all the data about the function calls to this function. And I don't know if you noticed, but the name of the function is like a, a string parameter there. So if you wanna like find uses of a different function, it's literally just use a different name. Uh, and, and that's pretty much it. You collected all the data that you needed. So now that we have the data, we have to analyze. And, and again, now we can just go like imperatively, like in a straightforward way, just one step after the other. So the first we're gonna check if the header is even included, uh, bail early otherwise. Identify the references to the functions we care about and try to identify the value of the parameter. All right, so here we're using the include graph collector and the pattern is you have like the include graph class and then you have the include graph data structure and every collector has this pair and essentially you can get the pointer to the data. I know that people are gonna look funny for pointers, but everything in Clang is pointers and no one, like, no one in the first week losing Clang can explain what the life cycle of the uh, objects in Clang are. Uh, yeah. So just look at the code on the screen, which dialects of C++ are we using? Is this 11, 14, 17? I'm, I, I, I have a confession to make that I'm not like a, primarily a C++ developer. So my code may not be like the most idiomatic code. Uh, this specifically is 17. Uh, but I'm sure I'm not doing like everything in the most idiomatic way. My, my question was like, what does Clang Meta Tool assume? Clang Meta Tool actually accepts 14. Uh, actually it may work in 11. Uh, we haven't tried. Uh, yeah. Can, can I just ask a question? I, I'm going to embarrass myself, but I just want to try to understand the workflow. And I've been, I've been trying to follow, and I may have missed something. What we're trying to do is we're trying, the input to this is a translation unit. Uh, 
And the output of this is a translation unit. Is that the idea that we're trying to factor a translation unit with another one? Yes, but a bit more detailed answer would be we're trying to change a specific file. So, and we're going to get to that later. Like we, we probably don't want to change a file that is not the main file. Okay, let me rephrase that. We're going to take as input all the files associated with the translation unit, and we are going to change a file and ideally its header if we were smart enough to create .h.cpp pairs. Is that about right? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. I think there's this. You can throw it. So one question that I have. If Clang MetaTool is something separate from Clang and uses a what, lib Clang or? Right, so that is a very important question and it was like a very important like workflow thing for us. Uh, it was important for us to be able to decouple ourselves from the LVM and Clang development process. So Clang MetaTool right now supports Clang 5, 6, and 7. So it's lib Clang. Yes. That's a portable one. Well, Clang tooling, it's a bunch of libraries. Uh, okay, the uh, question that I have is, why does Clang MetaTool not build an index? With, because this still looks like a AST matching for me. So you're saying AST matching is, is not what you want to do. With an index, you would just have this data available readily. You're like, not, like, like you're not wrong. Like provides you if you provide tools for that that I do for a living, so. You're, you're not wrong. Uh, our experience is that building like specialized data structures no, I'm uh, not talking about specialized data structures. It's a cross-translation unit lookup table. So what Clang does for a single translation unit to have that across the board. That's, that's what's missing in Clang D as well. So that's why I'm asking. I was uh, curious of if Clang MetaTool had that. So Clang MetaTool by itself will only look at a single translation unit. Uh, however, and, and <coughs> this is something that, that is like on our like roadmap at Bloomberg. The idea of having like company-wide visibility for things like that is absolutely a thing that we must achieve. Uh, so this particular tool does, like is not trying to solve that problem, but that, that is a problem that we have to solve uh, as well. A short question. Uh, 30 years ago, people loved not including headers, but sticking in what they called a function prototype into the C++ file. If you bail out, if the header is not included, won't you miss all those translation units that did that? Yes, and that is on purpose. Uh, because if, if we are not super confident that we know what we're talking about, I'd rather not make the change. And then we can go back and like go through a process of like fixing prototypes and then come back and refactor that again. But I'd rather be a bit pessimistic on when I'm confident about making a change rather than like make too many assumptions about like just because it has the same name, it's gonna be the same thing. Which is true with CD. Yeah. Unnecessary. Yeah. I mean it yeah, it it's complicated. So we are, we are trying to be more pessimistic on when to make the change. And so far, it has been good enough. Like, we have been able to make changes probably like 90% of the time, which is a pretty good result. All right, so now we can identify all the calls in the parameter. So the find calls collector has essentially has a, a, a few data, uh, uh, a few maps that it builds. I'm not going to go into details of like every one, but one of them is the call context. And so the call context essentially gives me like the call expression. And because I was collecting that particular function call, like I know that this is a call expression for that function. Uh, uh, I'm also making a few assumptions here that like defensive programming would have to be more careful, but uh, this is just fictional code for a slide. Uh, so we get the argument for the call expression. And then we ask Clang, is that an integer constant expression? And if it is, 
we accumulate our call saying like, hey, this call is calling this feature ID. And then we also like look in our logic implementation that I'm not going to uh, show here uh, if it is deterministic or not and what the value is. Uh, so that's why it's optional. Right. So now that we analyzed, we can refactor. This was surprising to me. Uh, I was absolutely sure before I started that what I would be doing, it would be like transforming the AST and redumping the code. Uh, but it's always string based. It's essentially like you specify like a source range in a file and you say replace that source range with this string. But turns out that this is actually better because most of the time, like you're not like rewriting the whole thing, at least on the approach that we're taking, because we're trying to make always the smallest possible change. So most of the time we have like a very specific thing that we're changing. And so being able to just replace it by a string actually works out. Just a comment, this is not contradictory. You can have the smallest amount of change, but you can still get rewrite. Right, so uh, the comment was you can have the smallest call, uh, amount of change and still true base rewrite it. Yes, uh, and in some cases we do. Uh, for instance, when we have to, when we're removing an unused variable that we just made unused, and that variable is declared in a, decla in a uh, declare statement, a decal statement that has other variables in it, we have to like resynthesize the decal statement uh, no, uh, subtree with that variable removed, emit that to a string, and then and then replace it. But because when dealing with uh, revenue generating code, uh, you can't uh, assume a particular formatting style, it's easier to be sure that you're making only that one change if you're doing like a, a, a string based replacement. You just said exactly what I was going to say. If you're outputting everything with a uh, client format, then life is great. Right. Life is not great. Right. Uh, and therefore, you have a lot of information captured in the format of the legacy code, and were you to do what was suggested, you would lose a lot of valuable information. No? Okay, pass this along to Peter. But I, I, I think that, that is a good discussion for after. Uh, can, can you just let me say just one sentence? All right, go. <laughs> uh, if you have not an abstract syntax tree, but a concrete syntax tree, you can keep around all comments, all white space, actually reform, uh, rewrite the code with a minimal amount of changes, and that's what we are doing. He has a huge budget. <laughs> Say it again? He has a huge budget. He has a huge budget. Uh, 12 years of working on that. <laughs> All right, one more question back there. Can you just throw the mic? Oh. Almost. So. There, we, there may be a problem because uh, uh, in some older code, uh, for example, in your case, this feature ID may be uh, defined as a macro, and the value of this macro may depend on your build configuration. For example, if you build with uh, some, then feature ID is one, and if you build in some other configuration, feature ID is two, and basically you cannot uh, just uh, replace in this case. So have you handled this uh, problem somehow? So. In Bloomberg specifically, we have had for the longest time a uh, straight out ban on conditional compilation. So we don't quite have that problem. Uh, however, as I said before, the AST does give you the annotation on whether or not this is part of a macro expansion. And so you would be able to say, hey, this is a macro. I'm not sure if I can replace it, just don't. Well, uh, it can be. A if def something in feature ID equals one, else feature ID equals two, then that that's why, like in the end, I will still code review it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I just I just want to say one thing. You you said that we completely ban conditional compilation. I just want to clarify: if the conditional compilation is coming from the platform, it's okay. Sure. If it's coming from the application, it is so not okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. All right, things to note. 
it is probably a good idea only to change the main file. Uh, it is possible to go changing whatever files you have write access to, uh, which is kind of scary, so be careful. Uh, when I first did it, I ended up like replacing all the files in the project, and like I happened to be included in files from other projects, and I ended up replacing things in all the other projects as well, which was not cool. So like paying attention to like where where the change is is important. It's also probably a good idea not to replace code in the macro because it's going to be super hard to know if this was the only possible expansion of this macro. And it's probably a good idea to make the smallest possible change. And the immediate feedback that I got when I was doing like a very similar type of change was, why are you leaving all these dead branches behind? Uh, and the answer is, it's super easy to review like this one function call change and then review a change that removes the dead branch when you can see there's a literal value right there. Uh, it's harder to review when you have to like take into account that this function may or may not be deterministic and now you're removing this whole branch and you, you would need like a, a backtracking of like why did it decide to remove this branch uh, which makes the process of reviewing this change harder and since we accept that we have to review it, then it, it would make this like unreasonably expensive to review. All right, so this is just an illustration. How, how do you skip things like that? Like you can just ask Clang, is it written in the main file? Uh, is, the, is this a macro body expansion? Uh, and I also included here because I didn't want to add in the other slide. Uh, so I had like an optional on whether or not the thing was, we had a deterministic value for it. So if we don't have a deterministic value for it, we just don't touch it. And then finally, the replacement itself. You just generate a new string. Uh, it's like just like some string stream formatting thing. Uh, and then you just add the replacement and you say, replace this node in the tree by this string. And that's it. Uh, but we do keep track of what are the decal ref expressions that we removed. And that's going to come handy next. So now we test. Test still fails. It fails by one less reason now. So we are replacing the function call. Uh, we're adding like the annotation in the comment that we wanted to add. But we're still including the header. And yes, we could run include what you use later. But removing include is not that hard. Uh, since we already have all the include graph data anyway. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is just make sure that we actually removed all the references to that header. And, and here we can use the file graph data. Uh, see if I can explain this without having to read a lot of code. But essentially, like the things to look for are this relevant bit, which sets like an edge. And then the, oops. The deco references map, it's a multi-map actually, because people sometimes do include the same header twice. Um, so you essentially traverse through, through all the include statements. And then we also have, uh, we have like the, the uh, set that we uh, collected before with all the deco ref expressions that we removed. So we find a deco ref expression from the main file to that header file that we didn't remove, then we don't remove the header, include. Uh, otherwise, we do. And again, this goes into like the correctness versus practical thing. I'm making a big assumption here that the include uh, statement will start in the beginning of the line and will end at the end of the line. Uh, it hasn't failed so far. Uh, I'm sure there is some way to make it fail. Uh, but we're essentially like translating the, the source locations from where the include statement was, uh, because we collected that in the preprocessor phase. And then we essentially set a cursor from the beginning of the line of the beginning of the include statement to the beginning of the next line after the end of the include statement. And then we just replace that range with empty. And then we add that replacement. And don't error check, because this is slide code. And now we run the test again, and we pass. We have successfully 
remove the function and remove the header. So now let's add a few more tests. We can check that different types of values work. We can test that non-deterministic results are not replaced. And we can also test that include don't get remove if it's still used. So true versus false. We have like the three different values and we replace including the quirky one that returns seven instead of like one or zero. Um, we have the case where it's non-deterministic. 15 is divisible by three and, uh, and five. So we know that it's not deterministic. And so the expected file is just the same file. And finally, if it is mixed between deterministic and not, we still replace the one call, but then we don't replace the one that's, that's non-deterministic and we don't remove the header because it's still used. And the test pass, that's amazing, cool. There's more. So, Clang Meta Tool has a constant propagation engine. Um, it currently exposed for char star and int because we're dealing with like simple types like that. But there's nothing that prevents you from essentially propagating any constant type of value. Uh, this is like this is the crux of how we actually manage to get a lot of a lot of things done. So this is like the same case that I said before, where you have like a variable that gets assigned to three, three. you have a function call, uh, then the variable gets reassigned, you have a different function call. And our goal is to still identify the correct feature ID and still remove the header. And in our use case at Bloomberg, we also took the extra step of removing the now unused variables, but I'm not gonna cover that here. So now we run that and not surprisingly, the test fails because that is not a uh, constant in, uh, literal integer expression. So what is the constant propagation? It essentially tries to, to evaluate a decal ref expression. It assumes that the decal ref expression is for a variable. It will not, it doesn't, it doesn't know how to evaluate complex uh, expressions. It only knows how to evaluate variables for now. Uh, it uses the claim control flow graph to actually traverse the code paths to identify if this variable has a deterministic value at this point, which in the example that we had, it has because we're assigning and using and it's not like in any conditional branch. There is no way that you can reach the function call without having reached the assignment first. And it will tell you if you can't resolve it. All right. So there's a bit of playing AST gymnastics that you have to do to like, because you get a uh, deco, uh, 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 an expression as the argument, but if we know it's a variable, then Clang has a, a, a double step thing where it implicitly casts the variable from L value to R value, and then you have the, the decal ref expression itself. So we need to like traverse these two steps and we need to use some LVM dynamic cast to know that the type of the node is the type that we expect. So if someone has like, I don't know, uh, pointer to the reference to pointer to the reference, uh, then we wouldn't be able to catch it. But that's fine because most of the time that doesn't happen. And finally, we get to the actual decal ref expression, which is the, the use of the variable. And then all you have to do is initialize the, the constant integer propagator, uh, run the propagation, giving the function decal where this statement is, and the uh, decal ref expression that uses the variable. So there's a, a, a reference here like call ctx.first. That was part of the map that find calls originally built for me. So uh, call context.first is the function decal in which this decal ref expression was found, which is all the input that we need to be able to build the control graph for that function and then be able to traverse the graph and find out is the value of this variable deterministic at this point or not? If it is unresolved, then we don't replace it. Uh, but if it is resolved, we, we just do. And yeah, 
test is fast. So things that I'm going to leave as exercise to the reader is removing variables left unused. Uh, this has, uh, I mentioned before, this has a bit of a complication because you may have initializers, uh, you may have uh, a decal statement that in declares several variables at once, and so you may need to declare, like, remove only one variable from that decal statement, which means that now you need to rewrite the entire decal statement with this one less variable, one fewer variable. Um, getting the value of global variables, which uh, John mentioned before. So we used a heuristic in that point, which was if we only see, if we see a variable that is initialized but never used as L value, or that is not initialized and is only used as L value once, we accept that that is the value of the variable. Uh, but yeah. And getting the value of trivial functions. Uh, because people like to write functions that just return a number for some reason. Uh, and this, I think, is probably the most important point of, like, of this entire talk. So this is like the single line of code count for this entire tool that passes all the test suite, including the tests. So we have 156 lines of C++. Essentially, like pretty much every line of that code, like was presented in the slides, uh, except for like the 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 logic to determine if it is the, uh, if we have the variable, or if we can determine the value of the feature bit or not, uh, and the replacement string for for that call. So this code, the code for the tool, is actually like I. It was like 3 a.m. this morning when I <laughs> posted through GitHub, uh, still on a PR. Uh, I also remember to regen the docs that were a bit outdated, uh, so you can go see the docs as well. All right, so, so next in the pipeline to be released, this is a tool that we're actually running through our code now, and we're like in the process of releasing as open source, which is essentially like a tool that generates patches to remove uh, dead branches. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and at some point, we're going to conjoin the dead branch removal with the constant propagation, such that if we can tell that the, even though it's not constantly dead branch, it is deterministically dead branch. All right. So now for some workflow considerations. Uh, so one thing that we decided kind of early is that we would not try to build a framework that runs a bunch of analysis and refactorings in your code. We're working on a bunch of small tools that can be used in isolation for two reasons. First, I'm too much of a postmodernist to believe that, that we can build a framework like this that will not be excessively complicated. Uh, but the second is, a lot of those refactorings, they have to be made like through a process where, uh, for instance, you start with like the least used libraries, and you review the changes in there, and you commit those changes in there, and then you start going down to like grow confidence and making a little at a time. Uh, because again, some of those legacy code doesn't have tests. So you really have to be like conservative about how to do it. But we're still taking the risk of doing it. Uh, uh, on the words of uh, the head of uh, SI, uh, I'd rather have a tool fail doing it than a human failing doing it. Uh, so we are applying those tools incrementally. So as I said, like we, we first applied a tool that generated a bunch of dead branches. And now we're going through and like removing those dead branches. And then there's going to be, after we remove those dead branches, maybe we'll find more deterministic things. And we'll just like keep iterating over and over and over. And at some point, we'll just be able to like throw away the tool. And we're not going to feel bad about it because it's just 156 lines of C++. Uh, so the goal is to eventually just remove the tool. Uh, we're globally at Bloomberg in in the analogous situation, we're like 30% there. Daniel? 
I just want to ask, because as you were talking, I was trying to write down what it is that this thing is, so I wrote uh, a tool to create a quick and dirty throwaway tool to run on a local code base and then run it and test what you can and hope for a few months and then breathe a sigh of relief. Is that about it? That, that's about it. Oh, good. I got it. So I, I keep joking. I, I, before starting this team at Bloomberg, I was working in like packaging, like package management infrastructure. So I used to joke that I was like the FedEx guy. Uh, and now I'm the janitor. So I'm like just going around and just like mopping stuff up. We still manually review all changes before committing. And likewise, for, for code that we don't uh, manage in a way that we could just commit, like we will, like we have this whole thing about figuring out how do we avoid like flooding uh, people's like GitHub repos with PRs. And then like they get 300 PRs from my tool and they hate me. Uh, so like there is like a whole consideration of like how do we manage the process of running that through, that through the code base. That is actually my question. My, um, if you say manually review, how long does it take? And what order of magnitude, let's say, of changes do you generate that you review at once? So there was a week. So we're doing this like in batches. Uh, so there was one week that I have probably reviewed like 15,000 lines of changes. And I, it so is what it is. I just sat through and just read every single change. So you don't have kind of a, a visualization where you just see before, after, and say, OK, 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 or not OK, or not OK? No, no we, we use code review tools. OK. So we have like, uh, like tools that will like, we'll be able to say, like, no, no, this line, the tool changed wrong. Or this line, the tool is changing it correctly, but it probably makes more sense for us to go and ask the, the developers to do something different because the tool is making the code worse. Um, but, but yeah. So you're, you're doing something like a git diff or whatever. You're doing some diff tool, and you're, we're walking through and saying it did this to that, and you're saying that makes sense or whatever. Yep. And just like any other piece of code, it may be absolutely impossible to tell from that point that it's going to work or not because there's something going on somewhere else in the world. There is definitely an amount of risk that we're running, and I got the OK for management, so I'm going. No, 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 that's, <laughs> that's fine. But let, let me be clear that because you don't have a global scope, the kind of changes that you make have to be sort of pruned into being functionally yes, equivalent absolutely. within some domain. And this is an important property of this tool. Yes. Because this particular tool does certain things really effectively and practically, and it doesn't do other things. That's correct. And like ha being able to, to reject changes when we're not confident and being conservative about being confident is an important part of that. So I have a broader question. I don't know if you're actually at the point where you're taking questions yet about the whole talk, but um, I, I think we're we can keep going. Yeah, you, you can keep going with questions. Yes. Okay. So um, I've uh, interacted with a number of tools that do very serious source um, AST transformations. Uh, Rose compiler out of Florence Livermore is is one example, and and uh, in, in a broader space, the uh, NBCC compiler from NVIDIA does some similar things. All of those people use the EDG front end. Um, upon asking a notable Clang author uh, if Clang would ever replace that, he said, no way, those guys are wizards. Um, so did I you look into using EDG for this kind of thing? And, and what were the things that led you to use Clang? So I have zero familiarity with EDG. Uh, so I, I don't think I can answer that question without spending at least like a month researching EDG. Okay. Uh, I don't miss anything yet from okay. Clang. Uh, it is definitely the case, uh, and this is actually something uh, that, that I'm going to talk a bit later. I am not trying to solve generic like programming language or computer science problems. I'm working on very specific pointed, like we have this specific subsystem sure. in the code base. We need to understand what it's doing, how it's doing it, uh, and, uh, and we need to make the change. There's a question like all the way in the back. <laughs> First off, I'm really sorry to the person in front of me. <laughs> 
I, I just want to make two comments. One was about uh, the, the EDG versus Clang. Uh, EDG's tooling, th at least the ones that I'm familiar with, is more source-to-source -source translation. It's much more holistic. And the tooling that, that you're using with Clang here is much more oriented around making like very localized edits, which is a kind of different problem. Yes. Um, and, and as an example, like the goal isn't to have something that is valid or equivalent, but to have something that looks good to users. And so in the Clang tooling, we spent a bunch of time optimizing around how do we rewrite things inside of macros and, and around comments so that they look good um, even if every now and then they're edge cases that are incorrect, like we'd, we'd rather that trade-off, which is essentially the opposite trade-off you make with the source-to-source -source translation. And so that's one interesting kind of difference between the two systems. Yeah, and, and I, I think in my case, I'm leaving, I, I'm even like one step like removed from even like what like Clang Format does, uh, which is I'm absolutely not trying to touch anything except the, the characters that I'm changing. The, the other comment I wanted to make was, um, you know, we've been doing this at Google for a while, and it is actually interesting that we 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 really quickly exceeded our ability to code review the changes, and and so like what what I anticipate is that the next batch of tooling you end up building are mechanical review tools to allow you to kind of verify things, because it turns out that the verification of a change tends to be much much easier than crafting the change, um, and so we ended up having like. Uh, having a, a collection of tools that allow us to do very, very large scale kind of validation of, yes, only the kinds of changes that I was expecting to come out of this tool's transformation show up, and flagging only you know a very, very small fraction of, of the changes, which for some reason don't match kind of one of the very expected simplistic patterns. So, so, yeah, so there is a way, there's kind of a, a, a path into more automated review. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, am wary of like the, the growth of like the size of the changes, but Bloomberg is a bit special in that respect uh, because while we do have uh, one mono repo for a lot of code, most of the code is spread out and managed by a lot of other people, which is a good segue for uh, my next slide, which is that like governance aspects <coughs> make this problem hard. Because if you don't have like the governance mechanisms in place to say like, you know what, I'm going to make this change. You have three weeks to review and reject, otherwise it's going in. Uh, so if we don't have like the governance mechanisms in place, this, this is hard. Uh, heterogeneous build systems make this problem harder. Because now you need to be able to like somehow get the compilation database for all like the bespoke make files that people write, which is hard. There's like a nice tool called Bear. There is another tool that uh, I forgot the name that parses the make output and generates a compilation database from the make output, uh, which is interesting. Forgot the name, uh, but it it would definitely like a company more verticalized that uses a single build system will definitely have an easier time. Uh, and this is kind of like a C++ problem in general. Like lack of package management make this problem like even harder because you can't tell how to use something. And no, modules do not solve that problem at all. Uh, so as I said before, we're working mostly on Bloomberg specific problems. Uh, I think anyone that is interested in like more generic like language and programming problems. I think Clang Tidy is the right framework for like those generic, like you're doing this C++ wrong kind of thing. Uh, and Clang Tidy dash fix is definitely a thing you should consider using. Uh, like we, we are pushing Clang Tidy dash fix somewhat aggressively. Uh, like my team is pushing it somewhat aggressively to be adopted at Bloomberg. So um, grading visibility for code base specific aspects is really good. So one thing that we did uh, that ended up being immensely valuable was we have a late data, uh, legacy database technology, a revenue generating database technology uh, that we really, really, really want to kill. Uh, and so 
we managed by using the constant propagation of, uh, co uh, of char star, we managed to identify the places in the code where particular databases were being accessed. So like as, as the project of retiring that legacy database technology, revenue generating database technology goes through, like people that own, the, own those databases can easily identify, so who is actually using this database? Uh, and again, simple grep doesn't work. Something like uh, C tags or uh, other indexing things don't really work because you need like constant propagation. You need to be able to know that this variable at this point has this value, uh, which is not something that is easily doable without like control flow graph. We are also creating an internal infrastructure. Um, and it's somewhat unfortunate that like I don't know how to make this generic, so I'm making it Bloomberg specific, to like keep those results up to date by like ingesting the code from application developers, running tools, storing results, presenting patches. So we're building a bunch of internal infrastructure. I wish I could find a way to make this like more open sourceable. Uh, I don't have that answer right now. And I think anyone dealing with like a large decentralized code base will likely have the same problem. The other bit is trying to uh, build this workflow outside of the normal CI process makes adoption easier. So one thing that we're doing is we're actually like, uh, so a colleague of mine came with the joke that we're like uh, Cambridge Analytica of code because we'd say like, here's the, this cool like static analysis tools and then we just like siphon off the code as like a tarball with like all the dependencies, the compilation database and everything such that we can run the, the tools outside of the CI process so we don't make the CI process even slower because C++ is super fast to compile. So in summary, I think writing tools is now a lot more accessible. I hope I have like made that point. Uh, the Kling method tool approach has helped us a lot. We have been able to start like churning out tools to like do specific things, do them fast and get results fast. And hopefully at some point just delete them. And I think it definitely can help you as well. And I think we have like now open questions. I was wondering where in the spirit of trying to make this more accessible, why you didn't pick a, a dynamic language like Python maybe to do the actual so that, that is a good question, uh, and the answer is I did, but then I gave up. Uh, so when I, was, when I was trying first, the Python minings to Clang were hyper unstable, uh, and they didn't export visibility into the AST matcher API. I don't know if they do now. Uh, maybe with like the Clang query like interpreted parsing thing, it would be possible. Uh, but not being able to use AST matchers would set us back like by several months. Like the AST matcher API is definitely like definitely the biggest changer. Just to clarify my understanding, the code that you are transforming is mainly C and not let's say C plus plus seventeen. No, no, we're parsing C. Uh, Bloomberg is now in C plus plus fourteen. We're like going through a compiler upgrade to switch to 17. Um, but we are running those analyses on C and C++. As long as we can see how the compiler was invoked, we can run the tool. And we will include the test cases for the use cases that we see in our code base. I, I was asking because I was wondering how to do the matching with overload sets and template instantiations and stuff like that to actually figure out where things are actually used. This is style of coding the things that we're trying to remove that are very C and Fortran style. Yeah, so okay, the, the, the types the of language, problems. From the language parsing and understanding, it's the, the easier stuff. Yes. Yeah, we have a lot of low hanging fruit. Let's put it this way. <laughs> <laughs> it worked three times. <laughs> All right, so yeah, the, the point here is that we, we as a company started out in really was 1980. And there are people that started working at Bloomberg who didn't have a computer science degree. And there is an actual problem that I think this tool will solve that I was gonna talk to you about, 
And I might as well tell you here, <laughs> there was a time when we had date times and they were millisecond resolution. We had to change them to microsecond resolution. As a result, we, we erased all of the millisecond resolution footprints from existence, but we checked to see if they're there. Now it turns out in the old world, zero was a valid millisecond representation. Now I'm sure no one would ever do this, but people actually do mem copy or mem set zero into types to initialize them. We all do that, right? No, but people do that when they don't know what they're doing. And this is pervasive throughout the Bloomberg code base. And so I think the tool that you just described is picture perfect for going through and finding cases where that happens using memset. You look for memset, you say, am I a memsetting this into a date variable? And say, okay, we gotta not do that. Would that be Yeah, and, and, and again, that is precisely why it is important to us to be outside of the Clang code base, to be outside of Clang tidy, because we can go and like make a very specific question, have a very specific answer, and move on. You touched a little bit on the governance aspect. What I find interesting is that, as far as I understand, you're the one doing the review after the tool generates the output and then you are sending a PR to the people that own the code. The other way around. I send the, the review first. If they don't respond, I do. Okay, but the first step is that if you send the PR without looking at the output, they are expected to review it. Yeah. Okay, so there's no double review there. No. no okay, no. okay, makes sense. I have kind of a related question. I could see how uh, using a tool to do this rather than doing it manually is advantageous because uh, machines can make fewer errors than humans. But if you're still going through it with a fine comb and reviewing every line, it, it must take almost as long as to do it by hand. No. So, no. so why several, is it, why several, is it a lot several orders of magnitude less? Because when when I'm doing this code review, like I don't need to check like if it has like. Uh, what I need to check when I'm reviewing a tool assisted change is that the semantic of the new code matches the semantic of the old code. That's it. And when I'm making like a single like function call change, I don't need to check whether the value of that thing actually is what it says it is. I trust the tool to get the right value. What I'm doing is just seeing like, is this expression in the right place replacing the right thing with something that has the correct semantics in it? Yeah, but how can you check that without doing what you would do if you had to do it manually? I think you're underestimating just like how much code changes happen. Mm. Huh. I want to try to answer that. What we're doing here is we're getting something like flypaper where we're accumulating knowledge on this tool. This tool is getting smarter and smarter, this, this one we're manufacturing. He's got an overall tool that produces you know, throwaway tools. But the throwaway tool gets smarter and smarter as we work on it till it gets to a point. Now it could be 80-20, it could be 90-10, probably it's 98-2. Then we apply it and then we go in and visit the last 2% ourselves. Isn't that right? Isn't that pretty much how you do it? For now, I'm still like actually reading all the changes, but most like it, it's a much lighter weight review than if a human was doing it. Because it's setting it all up for yeah. you. All you need to do, if you think about it, you're just going through and doing line by line, going, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think that just following, following up this constant propagation by hand would be a, a, a Absolutely. Know, it, it would just kill the effort immediately. Which, which was, so when we're doing the, the dead branch removal, we were actually doing the constant propagation and the dead branch at once. And we gave up because it was super hard to tell. We ended up like with like huge comments in, in the, the code review saying like, the tool decided to remove this branch because this, 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 and this, the variable is assigned there. And it's like, I, I, like, I can't. I, I, I need to be able to just look at the code and see it doesn't look wrong. Uh, were there any mistakes which your tools made and which you missed on your review and which ended up in your code base and you have had to deal with them later? So far? No. <laughs> no, because I'm, I'm actually, like, I'm not joking, I'm actually reading every single line. 
So not, not enough. You say you put it into the codebase and there were no bugs detected later as a result of it? So far, no. Serious. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> no tests, just eyeballs if it's all good. Seriously? I mean, the fact that we're making surgically small changes helps. Can you, can you? <laughs> I mean, we did find bugs in the code because we were doing the removal. So like there was this, there was hilarious that was, we had like, we ran the dead branch removal and I saw this big if statement. I was like, wait, why is it removing this branch? And it was like, if our code equals one or our code equals two or our code equals five or seven. And the code has like has been there for like twenty years. I guess it's how it works. Uh, did you try to use some coverage tool in production to check, uh, like, <laughs> is it really a dead branch or not? We are only removing when it's statically a dead branch. Yeah, but like, uh, how you can know it without like actually running the code if you don't have by codes? using the so Plain has. Uh, a, a cl uh, control flow graph uh, API where you can actually like kind of interpret the code and and you will know that this is the the only path that leads me here or all the paths that lead me here have this variable set to this value Mike So you first have to assume that you know how the function works. Uh, and yes, uh, as a, like, I probably spent like a good four months just like in the archaeology, and then we had to like go through all the production machines, collecting like what is the state of this configuration system in all those production machines, like building like a, a RabbitMQ agent in every machine, a RabbitMQ consumer that was like gathering the data putting it in a database and then producing reports and then finally get to a JSON file that says, this value is the same everywhere, this value is not. I guess I'll play devil's advocate. So you mentioned that this code has been there for 20 years, it works, generates revenue, nobody has to maintain it, so why are you doing this? Night capital. <laughs> so uh, anyone here does not know what night capital is? So Knight Capital was this high frequency trading company that, and I, I really, really recommend reading the postmortem for their case uh, because it's super good. They essentially burned half uh, a quarter of a billion dollars in uh, almost half, uh, half a billion dollars in 25 minutes because they thought that a feature enablement bit was not in the system, and there was an old executable that still had the old feature enablement, and they changed the value, and it started selling cheap and buying expensive. <laughs> and it did that millions of times per second for 25 minutes. N needless to say, the company is dead, uh, but I really recommend reading uh, the postmortem for that. At its, at its worst moment in that 25 minutes, they lost 800 million, but they managed to recoup half of it and only ended up losing 400 million. And I wouldn't really say that they went, uh, they died. They got acquired and merged with uh, another company. And so now the company is called KCG. So they're technically still alive. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, anyone else? I guess that's it then. Thank you. <laughs>